This morning, Brian did a very excellent job talking about lessons that we can learn from Hurricane Irma. And he wrote an article with more lessons. And one of the things that he did not mention that he did, in, he, he did this intentionally because he knew I was going to be preaching about it tonight, is a lesson of contentment. Hurricane Irma really did test our level of contentment. Many of us lost power, probably most people here, and we're just not used to that. Amen. And it, <laughs> it was difficult. It was challenging and uncomfortable for those of us that are used to having that. And it really tested... You know, are we really content in any and every circumstance? Have we really learned the secret of contentment? So that's what I want to talk to you about tonight, is the secret to contentment. What is the secret to being content? Do a Google search sometime for how to be content, and you'll find hundreds of suggestions. WikiHow will even give you 11 steps to contentment with pictures. The self-help shelves are full of books that will teach you how to be contented with research from the top world experts. You'll hear things like, love your job and be a good neighbor and think positively. All that these secrets amount to is a list of superficial brain tricks that the world has contrived, and none of them are substantial. So the secret to contentment is found in the gospel. And it's very substantive, and it's the only thing that works. So we're going to read about that tonight as we examine Philippians 4 in verses 10 through 13. I want to ask you to please turn your Bibles, if you haven't already, turn them to Philippians 4. Before we read that uh, section of Scripture, let me set up the context a little bit. Paul had been sent to Rome as a prisoner, and he was living in his own rented house. So... He's under house arrest, and he has to pay rent on this house that he lives in. The Philippians had sent a monetary gift to Paul on more than one occasion, and they had not had the chance to be able to send him one in a while, but now they had an opportunity to send him a monetary gift. And so the letter of Philippians is his thank you letter in response to that gift that that they sent. And so in chapter 4, and verses 10 through 13, Paul said, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Paul was content in any and every circumstance of life. That's a very uncomfortable statement. It's uncomfortable because if we are honest with ourselves, most of us would have to admit that we fail miserably in the area of contentment. We are spoiled in this nation and in this time of the world that we live in. The word contentment is defined by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary as pleased and satisfied, not needing more. It has the same origins as the word contain. In fact, the noun content is virtually the same word as content. And so it's kind of the idea of your circumstances are contained. Are you going to be content with the content of your situation? The Greek word that is translated translated contentment, it basically means, it literally means self-sufficiency. And the Stoics used that word to mean self-sufficiency enabled by sheer force of will. They taught that exerting the power of one's own will is all a person needs in order to have everything and need nothing. It amounted to indifference and apathy. It doesn't matter what's going on out there, I'll be just fine. It's like the song that says, I am a rock, I am an island, and a rock can feel no pain, and an island never cries. That's not how Paul uses the word. 
Paul uses this word to mean inner sufficiency enabled by Jesus Christ. So we're going to talk about that as we talk about three aspects of contentment here, starting with, in verse 10, the gratitude of contentment. Let's read that verse again. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. He's careful to say, I don't want you to think that, that I'm feeling like, you know what, you guys just didn't care about me. I know that you wanted to help and you couldn't help, but now you are able to help me again, and I'm so thankful. I am rejoicing in the Lord about this. Now, he is careful to explain in verse 17. Let's just read that verse. He says, Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. Okay? I don't know if any of you have ever had one of your young children to give you a gift that was maybe not all that valuable in and of itself. Uh, several Christmas, Christmases ago, uh, Ty, was, when he was really young, he gave me a gift of a ball of aluminum foil for Christmas. And I unwrapped it or pulled it out of the bag or whatever, and here's this ball of aluminum foil he wanted me to make into a knife. And so I did. Well, you know, that wasn't the best gift that I received on Christmas, a ball of aluminum foil, but it told me my son wants to give me this. It said a lot about his heart. I was more thankful for that gift because of what it said about him. In a way, that's kind of what Paul is saying here about the Philippians. He is thankful for this gift not so much because of the gift itself, but because of what it says about them and because of the spiritual benefit that they are receiving in God's eyes. However, uh, that comparison falls apart in this w sense. The gift that they sent him was valuable. Paul, as I mentioned earlier, had to pay rent somehow. And uh, he couldn't get out and make tents because he was under house arrest. So it would be logical to say then he would have to do it by receiving money from people and from churches. And so it was a valuable gift. He rejoiced greatly in the Lord about this. He was very thankful, even though he didn't have much and he was in prison. We too should be exceedingly grateful for our blessings, however small, even if it is, as it were, just a, a ball of aluminum foil. And we should rejoice in the Lord greatly. Are we thankful? Are you thankful? Truly thankful for all that God has given us? Am I? Have we really learned the secret of contentment? Do we do what Paul said to do in Philippians 4 and in verse 6, where he says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Do we give thanks to God in everything, in every situation. Sometimes I'm afraid we complain even about our blessings because we want better blessings. We have to really watch our heart. Well, now that Paul has expressed his joy over their gift, he is careful to explain next that he doesn't actually need it. In fact, in fact the rest of what we're going to look at tonight in the rest of these verses here is in that context. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the extent of contentment there in verses uh, 11 and 12. All right, verses 11 and 12. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. It seems that the reason for Paul's explanation here is partly to prevent a potential objection. He just said back in chapter 4 and verse 6, be anxious for nothing, and now he's th saying, I'm very thankful for this gift you gave me. And so I think what he's saying here is, well, I don't want you to get the idea that I was sitting just wringing my hands worried about, are they going to send me money? I really need money. No, I'm not anxious for anything, but I am thankful. Nonetheless, that you have sent this to me. You see, Paul didn't need anything in order to be content. He did not even need 
the necessities of life. That's another very uncomfortable statement. It's true in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10 that he says, if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But here in Philippians 4, he's not talking about us. He's talking about himself. He's talking about contentment in any and every circumstance, even the kind of circumstances where you don't have food and you don't have covering. The kind of circumstances that he talked about in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Consider verse 27 when he says, I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And that's just a taste of the things he mentioned in that context. Paul had experienced it all. And he knew how to be content, how to be self-sufficient, how to be inner sufficient in all of those situations. The gift that the Philippians sent him, therefore, was like icing on the cake. Though the money was helpful, Paul could live without it. Do you think he could manage if he didn't have his own rented house to live in? He didn't need a house to be content. He had the Lord. Paul's attitude was what he said in chapter 4 and verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. He doesn't say rejoice in the Lord when things are good. Paul says rejoice in the Lord always. That means in the good times and in the bad. And this is a man writing this from Roman imprisonment. Somebody says, well, how do I start thinking that way now? I want to change my mindset immediately to have this attitude of contentment that Paul had. Well, I'm afraid it doesn't work that way. It's a process. Contentment has to be learned. Paul says twice in these verses, I have learned. He says in verse 11, I have learned to be content. He says in verse 12, I have learned the secret. You see, contentment is not just some automatic thing. It is a lot. It is a learned skill. It is a mentality that is proactively and deliberately developed through the experiences of life. It may take you years to develop the kind of contentment that Paul had. Those who've lived life maybe for more years than myself, and maybe you've had a lot at one point, and then maybe at another point in life you had virtually nothing. And then maybe later in life you had a pretty good amount again, and then later you you had nothing again. What do you come to learn through those experiences? I can't count on any of this stuff. I can't count on any of these circumstances. That's not going to be what makes me happy, or I'm just going to be like a roller coaster. You learn that through the experiences of life. And so Paul had experienced that as well. We also see here that contentment is a secret. It's a secret. Albert Barnes, the commentator, says that the word used here is one that is commonly used in relation to mysteries and denoted being instructed in the secret doctrines that were taught in the ancient mysteries. In those mysteries, he says, it was only the initiated who are made acquainted with the lessons that were taught there. Here, this Gentile church that's receiving this letter, they they understood what Paul was talking about when he used this, this word for secret. I've learned the secret. They knew what it meant to be learning those ancient mysteries and to be initiated into those pagan ways of thinking and worshiping. And so Paul was taking that and he was turning it on its head and he was applying it to contentment. That in order to learn contentment, it takes being initiated into the experiences of the extremes of life. And we'll, we'll talk more about what else is involved in this secret, because there's certainly more involved. But I want to look at three areas of Paul's contentment that he talks about in verse 12. The first one is prosperity versus humble means. Paul had the unique experience of having ex- experienced... Uh, he had the unique experience of having experienced. That was just beautiful, wasn't it? Uh, the extremes of life. Before he was a Christian, he was a Pharisee. Pharisees were, generally, they were wealthy people that loved money. And I think it'd be safe to assume he probably was well off. In order to become a Christian, he gave up. Probably gave up a pretty great income. And came to rely on the selling of tents and on support from churches, which was few and far between. Would we be content 
in prosperity and with humble means. Not just in prosperity, but also with humble means. Some people are never content. Even when they're in prosperity, they want more prosperity, more. And if that's what you're basing your contentment on, you'll never be happy. I know a man who used to be rich. I, I think he would almost classify as a millionaire. Uh, he used to design stages for some of the most famous bands in the world, like Pink Floyd. And I met him at Bumby, and we studied together. Now, and he showed me pictures of the way his life used to be. The mansion he lived in, the cars he had. He had servants in his household. He had everything. And now, he lives below the level of poverty. He has nothing. He doesn't even have his health. But he has the Lord. And I was very impressed. We studied together for well over a year, almost every single week. And I never heard him once complain about his situation in life. So that's a good example, I think, for, for all of us. And that's the kind of attitude that Paul had. The second area of Paul's contentment was being filled versus going hungry. Now, this is one thing that probably most of us in here can't really relate to. My children tell me, I'm starving, when it's been a few hours since they've eaten. Most of us probably don't know what it's really like to be truly hungry. Some of you, maybe you've experienced that, not knowing where your next meal is going to come from. I've never personally experienced that. I can't personally relate to that. The third area of Paul's contentment is having abundance versus suffering need. This seems to be just kind of a catch-all. It could include uh, you know, possessions and money and so forth, but it could also include things like protection and comfort and friendship and health and justice. Paul knew what it was like to have all of those things. He also knew what it was like to have none of those things. And it forces me to ask myself, what could I do without and still be content? You know, Hurricane Irma forced me to ask this question to myself. You know, no AC, no air conditioning, no refrigeration, no warm showers. I mean, that was roughing it for me. Kind of sad to say that's roughing it for most of us, but that was roughing it. But, you know, I knew in a few days or however many days, I knew that it would come back on. And I would have those things again. Imagine, however, if you lost those things and you never had hope of ever having them again. You would never have air conditioning again. You would never have refrigeration again. You would never take another warm shower. Could you handle that? Could I handle that for the rest of our lives? Now, it almost feels silly to compare that to Paul. Because Paul lived 2,000 years before any of our modern conveniences. And even in the best of situations, he didn't have air conditioning, he didn't have refrigeration, and he didn't know what a warm shower was. And neither did our Lord. You see? And so here Paul is in prison. And he's not experiencing the best of situations 2,000 years ago. And he's still content. He's still content. Have you learned, have I learned, the secret to contentment that Paul had learned? Maybe few of us have. Now this doesn't mean that it's wrong to have abundance, that it's wrong to want better circumstances. I don't want you to feel guilty if you're maybe going to school to get a better education, to have a better job, or, or maybe you're saving up to put a down payment on a better home to live in. It doesn't mean that you're a sinner if you ever want anything better. Paul didn't want his thorn in the flesh that he talked about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, but he was content for it to remain when he saw that it would not be removed. Paul did not want to be in prison. He talks about in Philippians chapter 1. He wanted to be a free man, but he did see the blessings of being in prison. And he was content to settle for what he did not want. Now certainly the desire for better circumstances and for material things can become so extreme that it's sinful. No doubt about it. We can become like the Israelites who craved in the wilderness and God was disgusted with them. 
But there is nothing wrong in and of itself with desiring to improve your situation. Paul's point is that whatever he does not have, he does not require. And that's contentment. That what we do not have, we do not require in order to be satisfied, in order to be content. We should accept our present circumstances regardless of what they are without anxiously clamoring for something better. Fanny Crosby, who wrote many of the songs in our hymnal, she was blind and she wrote, Oh, what a happy soul am I. Although I cannot see, I am resolved that in this world contented I will be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't. To weep and sigh because I'm blind? I cannot and I won't. Can we say that? I mean, I can't relate to being blind. That would be hard. I don't know if I could say what she said, at least right away. That might take a long time to come to that point. But could we say what she said about life in general? Whatever our circumstance, however difficult the situation we're in, can we decide to be happy in that? Now that Paul has described the extent of contentment, he explains how it is that he obtained it. He explains the source of contentment in verse 13 when he says, I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Other versions read, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. At its heart, the concept of this verse is this, to be enabled by the help of another to be satisfied with less than what is needed. Strengthens means enables. I can do all things through Christ who enables me. Without the presence of that helper, contentment would be impossible in such circumstances. Survival might be possible, but not satisfaction. And that satisfaction is only possible in the presence of that helper that is totally independent of any circumstance of life. Consider you have a, a, a child, a young toddler or baby. And this baby is contented with maybe just one toy, maybe no toys, as long as mommy is in the room. But the moment mommy leaves the room, baby goes ballistic. Or a wife who is contented to live in conditions of extreme poverty as long as she has the loving support of her husband to lean upon. But take that away from her and there's no way that she can endure these situations. You see, it's the same with Jesus Christ. He is our helper. He is the one who enables us, who strengthens us, who empowers us. And Paul says in Galatians 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That means the Christian always has Christ in us all the time. How can we be enabled to endure difficult situations, to be content no matter the situation? It is because we have Christ in us. We have His presence there all the time. Without Him, there's no way we could endure it. There's no way we could do it. That's the secret to contentment. And that's the secret the world doesn't know. I can do all things doesn't mean I can accomplish anything. That's the way that this verse is largely understood, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me means I can win the ball game or I can ace the test or I can earn a million dollars. No, this verse has more application to things like when you fail, when you fail the test or when you lose the ball game or when you have no money. You see, I can do all things means that by Christ's strength, we can be calm in adversity and humble in prosperity. In its context, it means I can be content in any and every circumstance of life. Jesus is the source of contentment. There is no other source. Not good circumstances. Think about the people you know who are the most content in their lives. What's their secret? Is it that they have no struggles or situations that disturb them? Do they have everything in the world that they could possibly want? Are those the things that bring contentment? No. 
What about the abundance of things? Is that where contentment comes from? Well, no. Think about this generation and how much stuff we have. If you wanted to have contented children, would you give them every little thing their, their hearts desire? Would that produce contented children? No, it would do the exact opposite. It's ironic that the least thankful and the least contented generation has had the most stuff and the best circumstances ever in the history of the world. And we're living in that generation now. So the abundance of things does not produce contentment. Contentment is in knowing Jesus. That's where contentment is found. Philippians 3 and verse 10, in this context where Paul is talking about all the things he gave up in order to become a Christian in his former life as a Pharisee. And he counted those things as dung. He counted them as loss so that he may gain Christ. He says in verse 10, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death. Philippians 3 and verse 10 precedes Philippians 4 and verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It doesn't only precede it chronologically, it precedes it logically. In order for us to know, I mean, in order for us to be able to do all things through Christ, we have to be First, we have to know Him. Someone may be listening to this lesson and say, Preacher, tell me what to do to, to be able to, to learn contentment. Here's the one thing that I would tell you. Know Christ. Know Him. Don't just be on a level of familiarity with Him. Don't just be His acquaintance. Be His friend. Know Him. Have Him in you. And then you can begin to learn contentment. Why have I not found contentment, you might ask? It's not because I haven't found the 11 steps and discovered the secret that pop psychology wants to tell me. It's because I don't know Christ. And He's not in me. Until you know Him, you will not view your circumstances through Him. But once you know Him, you'll view your circumstances through the lens of Jesus Christ. And you'll see that Jesus had nowhere to lay His head. It's not like He lived in the 21st century with air conditioning and with refrigeration and with warm showers. And you'll see that Jesus Christ submitted Himself to God to the point of death, even the death on the cross. And you will find strength to be able to do all things through Christ. A contented and joyful life is entirely within the reach of every single one of us. What a wonderful life it is to be content. I want to read a, a few quotes. Contentment is a feast without end. He is richest who is content with the least. That's Socrates. He is well paid that is well satisfied. Shakespeare. He who is content can never be ruined. He who wants little always has enough. The contented man is never poor. The discontented, never rich. Here's what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 5. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep. And Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Oh, there's nothing better than godliness with contentment. And the beautiful thing about it is contentment really isn't, it isn't all that hard to find. The secret of contentment is really no big secret at all. It's simply a matter of fully entrusting your lives to our Savior and being entirely at His disposal. May you and I, like Paul, learn the secret of being content in any and every circumstance of life. Take your songbooks and turn to the song that's been selected. If you're not a Christian, there are so many blessings that you're missing out on. Obviously, salvation and the hope of, of being with God for all eternity. But you're also missing out on living a life of true fulfillment that has nothing to do with circumstance. The world doesn't understand that. 
And you can't understand that until you become a Christian. And so tonight, I want to invite you, if you're not a Christian, and you're old enough to be one, to make the decision, having believed in the Lord, to repent of your sins and to confess His name and and to be baptized, so that you will be saved, and so that you can live a life of fulfillment in the here and now as well. If you'd like to become a Christian or if you need our prayers, we invite you to come to the front as we stand and sing the song of invitation.